Global Affairs. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Today marks the continuation of our ongoing series dedicated to exploring the vital role of the CAO in municipal governance. In this installment, we delve into what truly makes a successful CAO council relationship. Along for the ride today is the co-host of our sister show, The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, Mr. Ian McCormack. Joining Ian and myself for this insightful discussion are two distinguished guests from Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, both Mayor Sherilyn Knox and City Manager Nathan Petto. Together, they offer a firsthand account of their collaborative efforts and synergies that drive positive change within the community. Throughout the episode, both the mayor and city manager will share their experiences shedding light on the dynamics that underpin a healthy partnership between municipal administration and council. From communication strategies to mutual respect, they will explore the key ingredients that contribute to effective governance and community advancement. Our dialogue promises to unveil valuable insights into how a strong working relationship between the council and CAO slash city manager can yield tangible benefits for the entire community. Whether it's navigating challenges, implementing innovative solutions, or fostering community engagement, together we'll exemplify the power of collaboration in municipal leadership. So tune in as we embark on a journey to uncover the secrets of building and sustaining a successful CAO council relationship as we learn from the experiences of those at the forefront of municipal governance in Portage, the Prairie. This is Municipal Affairs. I want to start with you, Nathan, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask, what has made the partnership between Portage La Prairie's administration and council as successful as it has been? Well, I think like all good relationships, it starts with the foundation of trust. Uh, it's something I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of the councillors that uh, were re-elected and then, of course, four new councillors. So just starting with frank conversations about what are administrative roles? What are governance roles? What are you trying to accomplish and how you can work together to accomplish those things? And I think if you start with those, you know, when I, there's a, when I was an exchange student, uh, I went to South Africa and the most successful relationships I had with my host families is when you sat down at the start and just said, what are really your expectations? Should I do my own laundry? Should I help with the dishes? Should I help with dinner? And when you had that understanding, instead of saying, oh, no, everything's great, everything's great, when you have those frank conversations right off the bat, it makes the relationship move so much smoother because each party knows what to expect from each other. So I've always taken that lesson from being an exchange student to all sorts of relationships, but especially that CAO council relationship, having frank conversations, setting expectations, and then checking in to make sure you're going the right direction. And what about yourself, Mayor Knox? How would you describe the partnership between your administration and your council? I I totally agree. I think it's open communication makes the the biggest difference. And a real, I think one thing that we pride ourselves on here is a real good understanding of what our roles are, what the difference between governance and administration is. And it's been important to lead those discussions right from the very beginning um, for, you know, there's people around a council table that that don't even have, say, committee or board experience. And so taking the time to build that education so that they understand and set the set the tone right from the beginning, I think, is one key to success. I'll jump in on that if I can and talk a little bit about trust, because I think it's actually a really good place to start. And those municipalities that are functional seem to have trust, and those that aren't functional, whether it's historic or whether it's recent, don't have the trust. So how do you prove yourselves? Meryl, maybe I'll start with you, Sherilyn, and see how do you make how do you trust the CAO when you become a new elected official or other members of staff for that matter? Yep. Um, I think really taking the time to understand their role and ask lots and lots of questions. Um, I think we, by asking the questions of not just what we're doing, but how do we get there, I think is important. Um, and I think having a city manager or is who, 
who really communicates that to us as counsel, but we also see the way he communicates to his staff um, thoroughly is important. But, and you just, I think you build the trust by just always being open and having those conversations that nothing's off the table to discuss. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, was Nathan, Nathan, maybe to you too, uh, you get new bosses every few years. <laughs> you have no say in it. You have no say in the composition of those bosses either. How do you convince them to trust you? How do you learn to trust them? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned already, and, and I think Mayor Knox has talked about creating that foundation of trust with those frank conversations to start with. But one thing, and you know, I've heard this from CEOs that have 20, 30 years experience, as they always say, no surprises. Work really, really hard to keep your counsel informed on the things that they know, and you're going to know what's politically important to them. So keep cognizant of that. You know, often it, I hear a lot of CEOs talk, well, you got to stay out of politics, got to stay out. Okay, stay out of politics, but you need to understand the political environment you're in. And if you understand what's important, and you when you see things coming down the pipe, you can create a situation where you can inform them so they don't get surprised and vice versa. I ask that of my counsels. If there's things that you want to see happen, you know, don't keep that to yourself. Let me know. Let's start with an environment of no surprises. You, you talk about trust and you talk about some of the attributes that goes into making a good relationship. But you two, and I say you two as in mayor and the city manager, deal with each other probably more often than any other administration and council member deals with any parts of the administration. So that means trust has to start between the two of you. And that foundation has to start with the two of you. How important is it for both of you to come together on a regular basis and have those frank discussions? Because frank discussions don't just happen once a month or once every quarter or once every every time you're sitting down and doing those agenda packages, that trust gets built over time. What is the qualities that when you do sit down and those frank discussions do happen, that you can have it out in a setting where it is private and say, city manager, I disagree with what you're saying here. And as mayor, I think we need to go a little bit further and we need to go faster because I'm hearing from my residents and you're only dealing with what you're doing as administration. So what qualities and what time frame does those frank discussions need to happen to ensure that trust doesn't evaporate and become a toxic trust? So I want to start with Nathan on that one. Yeah, I, the, the previous mayor, uh, Mayor Ferris, uh, always said to me that you need to, he is, his point of view, he would always praise administration in public and correct in private. And I think from a, when I see administrations in the municipal sphere across the province, the ones that seem to be attacked <laughs> publicly, and there are municipalities that that does occur, uh, that really affects the trust of administration and the team that I'm supposed to lead is faith in the council. And when you lose that, it's hard. It's hard to uh, lead lead from a place with authority when the, you, for your administration doesn't feel you have trust. In terms of that communication, it's good to have scheduled meetings, but you need to have that open door, informal check-ins. When something comes up, and I frequently have, well, actually, I'm looking at a sticky note with about two or three things that are listed. Oh, I should give a heads up to Sherilyn on that. Oh, I should uh, talk to the mayor about this. Just as I go, and then when there's an open door, hey, let's chat and talk about it. You know, the best thing uh, about uh, Mayor Knox is, is a great sounding board for what the political feeling will be on some of the actions of administration. So if I can do that first checkpoint, then I get a good idea of how the rest of council will receive it. Well, can, can I, I'm going to just ask a very simple question. How hard is it to say no to each other? Because as the city manager, <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> But as city manager, you know what administration can do. And as council, you know what the uh, sort of residents are looking for from your municipality. Is it hard to say no to each other to say, unfortunately, we can't do that, or unfortunately, that's not the way we need it done because our residents are expecting more? Sherilyn? I I think that particularly Nathan and I have, we're, we're both idea people. And so I think we're very good at like, I'm a sometimes 
over idea person and and I know I can just throw everything out to Nathan right and and I know some things he'll take as okay well let's think about moving this forward and I know he also has the sense to be like well I'm just going to listen to her crazy ideas and and <laughs> keep going um just I think too when you when you were talking to earlier about trust Nathan and I have a unique sort of background as well is I work, I worked in student politics. So I worked for a student's union at a university and Nathan was a part of the student's union. And if you know anything about student politics, it's a whole other world. And so sometimes some of the issues that we find in municipal politics are pretty minor compared to student politics. So gives us a perspective that, you know, when you talk about we have they he has a new boss every four years, but we have they have a new boss every year in student politics. Just yeah. just on that, just to follow up with Nate on that one for a second, because uh, the mayor just said some pie in the sky comments, uh, pie in the sky uh, issues that she might be bringing to you. Is it hard to say no when you're trying to build that trust with council and you're trying to build the reputation of a well-functioning administration with not only council, but residents as well? Chris, you're going to get me to give away all my <laughs> politician handlings uh, tricks here. <laughs> Look, well, that's, uh, that's I, what we do on the municipal yeah, affairs. <laughs> you know, so I think the important thing when, uh, you know, I think we probably have all come across someone in a professional world where it seems like the first answer is always no. And when you come to someone with an idea in that environment and it's always no, 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 we talked about trust. If they're not legitimately considering and thinking out the idea you just brought forward and giving it, you know, wholesome consideration, then that relationship's going to be damaged. So uh, I think we, uh, the mayor and I have a relationship when she brings forward an idea, I can genuinely ask questions and talk about why this is important, what we're trying to accomplish. I think that having those conversations and legitimately considering any request, no matter how pie in the sky it may be, I think is important. Uh, ask questions, ask good questions. And sometimes with the answers they're answering, they may see that's not the best idea going forward. In terms of counsel, well, I think that's a really important to have a really solid understanding of your strategic priorities, which is something this council has done a great job of doing. And when we set those priorities, you set the, you know, the posts and you say, okay, these are our goals. But if you, something else comes up and it will during four years, some idea will come forward and it'll have a lot of momentum. You need to be able to have that conversation. Okay. If we take on this, then we need to talk about what's coming off the table. And if they're not willing to take off something off the table, then maybe that's not the best idea in terms of resources and taking your time and putting behind it. So those are generally the conversations I have with council and the mayor, uh, but I, I just want to reinforce that idea. It's just, if you say no to everything right off the bat without due consideration, I think you're going to have a, a poor relationship with your with your council and your governance board. Sure. Just a, a quick anecdote. A generation ago, I was a vice president of a student union at the U of A, so U of Alberta, so I can I speak your language as well. Um, I'd like to get to some of this piece around, I want to try to address risk a little bit, because some of these ideas are particularly innovative. And most councils, when they get elected, especially if it's a contested election, are really thinking they have good ideas, their ideas are better than somebody else's. How do you address the requirement from council or request from council, and I'll, Nathan, Nathan, to you, how do you address that re request for innovation for whatever reason? with whatever council's appetite is for risk, like prudent risk potentially, but recognizing that not everything's gonna work. Yeah, but that's actually a really great question. You have to determine when you're, when you're talking about innovation and in government, it's interesting because traditionally, I think people consider government to be not overly innovative. I, I think that's a fair sentiment that you hear all the time. And the one thing I find about working in government is we seem really, really scared to fail because our failures are public. It's not buried in some shareholder <laughs> you know, uh, spreadsheet or anything like that. Our failures are on the front page. Everybody knew how to do it better. Everyone knew you were going to fail when you tried. So I think having a council that you can have a frank conversation with is, we're going to try something new. What are your app? What is your appetite for failure? What does failure look like? What's the best case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? 
And if they want the best case scenario, but they're not really too keen on even addressing or couldn't stomach the worst case scenario, you need to have those conversations. What is your appetite for failure and what is the fail what could the failure look like? But if you have a counsel, I would even say 30% of the time this is going to fall flat in its face and still willing to go forward. I think you can do some pretty creative things in government. Carolyn, would you agree with that? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think having an administration that that gives you all that information is important. I like, I mean, as we're, as I was listening to Nathan, I can think of a number of times around the table where Nathan has really laid it out for us as to this decision you're making can have both, you know, mostly political repercussions for you in the community. Are you willing to stand behind it and make it? And, um, his his knowledge never he never politically influences us. I use the wrong word there. He just gives us all of the information so that we can feel comfortable with the decision that we're making. And mm -hmm. and I think that's important. We know what the risks are. Sure. Well, and to me, you as council have hired an expert to manage the city, and mm -hmm. the expert you've hired hires other experts as well. So they should be giving you enough information to make informed choices. Just before I hand it back to Chris, you were starting to talk about priorities and a recognition probably at the beginning of a term, you have things you want to see done, you as a collective as council. So um, to Sherilyn, how, how, do you in, in, uh, how do you look at your priorities? How do you set your priorities and how do you pass them on recognizing what interest council fascinates your CAO? Yeah, we... We didn't jump as our as a council and in the previous council too, we didn't jump in like we get um, elected at the end of October, November. We didn't jump in and do our strategic plan November 15th. We took we really do take the time to learn our roles and learn what counselors do. So we do we do orientation right off the bat. We spent we spent time learning the departments of the city so that when we were making decisions, we had better understanding of it. Um, and then we took the time to do our strategic direction and we worked with experts on it, but we all came to the table with sort of what we what we ran on and what our ideas were and what we heard from the community. And then we set our direction for the next, what it ended up being about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that the way we did it, that everybody came to, nobody came to our table with axes to grind or, you know, their own personal agenda, I, I don't believe. And we see things really set out well for Portage of Prairie. Thanks. We're speaking to the two faces of Portage of the Prairie right now. The Portage of the Prairie administration face, which is Nathan, and the Portage of the Prairie council face, which is Sherilyn. Now, you both know that you both have roles to play in the grand scheme of municipal governance, but the average resident doesn't understand that. And I say that with respect. The average resident thinks that you, Mayor, can tell people, to quote my good co-host here, who's driving the greater and where they can go drive it. You as administration, Nathan, understand that you can't direct policy. You cannot pass policy. You cannot change things on the fly. How important is it for both of you to have that respect to say, Sherilyn, this is what I'm hearing from the residents who are talking to us as at the front desk when people walk into City Hall. And Nathan, uh, this is what I'm hearing from people about what where the greater needs to be more present in because it doesn't seem to be there on a regular basis after snowfalls. We we talk about the the roles, but the average resident doesn't, doesn't understand that. So do you do you discuss what you're hearing from residents on a regular basis when you're having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, Nathan? Yeah, I think we talked about those sort of micro check-ins that uh, uh, Mayor Knox and myself have. And and you're right, sometimes I hear political nature feedback, and I think if it's relevant, and I think it's relevant to the overall organization or practical way, I will bring it up. And just like I would expect any counselor around the table, or the mayor, if they were hearing or seeing things that they don't believe live up to the service levels we've committed to, or the, you know the ideals we've committed to as a municipality, 
they should be bringing that to me. Like that's my job to try and fix that part of the the, the ship to make sure it runs effectively. So, yeah. The reason you know, I, I asked that, and I apologize to interrupt here, Nathan. The reason okay. I asked that is traditionally from someone who's worked in administration, uh, the CEO gets crapped on a lot. And I say that because you are the face and you're you're nodding your head a little bit for those who are listening. So you understand that you go out in the community, people assume that you are the one who's directing counsel on what they're doing and what they're not doing. Mm -hmm. Sherilyn, how important is it for you to protect your city manager, to protect the, the administration from those negativities? Because technically the, the decisions you pass are the ones that administration are implementing. So it's not administration just taking it upon themselves to do whatever they want. It's council's direction of what the administration is doing. And that is a true test of a relationship is if you can pick up the phone or pick up the uh, pick up the social media and say, this is my decision. This is the mayor's decision, not administration. They're just fulfilling what we've asked of them. I, I think it's incredibly important. And, and that comes from the messaging that we put out from city council to the public and through our media is making sure that they understand that it is the direction of council. Um, and that just that just takes time. But it's but it's also it goes this other way too, that making sure that our citizens know on the day to day that it's administration or our departments that they should be talking to about issues they have and you know, it's not the mayor who who does anything about their parking tickets, right? You have to you have to be giving that information to citizens as much as you can about where the where the changes in policy and you know the budget and the strategic directions come from, but how it's executed are two different things. Sorry, before I throw back over to Ian. So the reason I asked that question is the follow-up with you, Nathan, is Again, from someone who's worked in administration, I know that sometimes council's decisions, administration goes, we can't do that. We can't do that with what we've been given or what we are potentially being asked to give. How do you sort of protect your administration from the political fallout uh, or political request that a, a council has given to your administration without saying to them, you're just being unrealistic in your expectations? Because administration uh, council is there and council is there for a reason to direct administration to do whatever they ask. And sometimes that's unrealistic. Mm hmm. Well, that's a there's a multifaceted question there, but I'll start with, you know, if a decision's being made, uh, you know, in a, in a legislative type way, it happens at that council table. So administration should have all of the ability it can in most circumstances to bring forward its concerns, evidence, information for council to make the best decision. If I feel honestly that council is about to make a decision that it can't be implemented in any practical way, could violate the municipal act or anything like that. I would, uh, you know, with my relationship with council, I would just reach out and say, well, could we defer this business to another meeting so we can get more information for you? So try to avoid being in those situations as best you can with the power and leverage that you have. Not always going to happen. But if council makes a decision and it doesn't violate the municipal act or anything practical that, you know, you have a legislative responsibility to uphold, then I think as administration, and I've had this conversation with my administration, okay, I know everyone around this table is not a fan of the decision council just made. But the decisions have been made. Our goal is to make sure that can be as successful as possible. So we need to do everything we can to make council's decision implemented correctly and be successful as best we can. If we can't, well, you know what? I, I don't want to be a person who says, I told you so, because we don't. Uh, but we had to put that to the side, personal feeling sides, and be professional, because that's what we are ultimately is hired as professionals. And uh, with authority comes accountability. And you will work your hardest to make sure that they are right. That's an interesting segue into something actually we spoke about right up the top around role clarity. A couple of you who brought it brought it up. And of course, when people get elected to a council, they've probably been involved in the curling club or maybe the parent association at school or something like that. They may not understand the role of what a councillor really is. Sherilyn, how do you keep new people, well, and everybody focused on their role? How do you keep council focused on governance or may help them understand even what governance is and what it's about? Um. Well, like I said, 
with with us we we definitely do education and training right off the bat for our council as a whole with with Nathan included in that um also just giving them the tools of the toolbox I'll say you know we love your book Ian who's driving the greater it's an important one I think for all municipality municipalities but it's and I think what we've what I've found and Nathan might agree is that a lot of our counselors who are new to come in, who've been in the role now for a year and a bit, find out it's w different than they expected. Right. Because I think people are used to hands-on roles and, you know, directing and, and that side of things where governance isn't that. You know, governance is really about working together to make decisions and then leaving it to our administration and the rest of our city employees to execute. Um, and you have to make sure that you're working with your council to understand that we have we have hired Nathan. Nathan is our city manager, and we we trust him that he's going to lead that ship or boat or drive the car down the road to make sure that things get done. Um, but it, but it takes it takes time, and and we know. I know by having lots of conversations with colleagues that that we're very lucky with how things are happening here in Portage La Prairie because I wouldn't say we're always the norm around the country. That's for sure. Yes. Well, it, it, a lot of that is has to do with culture and expectations as well, that it can be a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle in some partic in any particular case. It are we mentioned orientations for council too at the beginning. Are they mandatory in Manitoba? No, they're not. Why do you do them? You know, why has because it's a resource. It's re, sorry, it's resource uh, intensive, and it sounds like something you do that not everybody else does. I I think because people need all the tools in the toolbox, they need to understand um, what their roles are. It's it can be overwhelming when all of a sudden you decide to put your name in a hat and run for to represent your city. And then all of a sudden the city expects you to do that in you. So you need to have all of the knowledge that you can and understanding. Cause a lot of times I would say a lot of times you're going to get counselors that are leaders in their own respect, right? So, so whether they've been bosses, entrepreneurs, um, leaders of, like you said, curling clubs, um, which leadership roles are all different. So helping them understand what governance is, is huge. And maybe to Nathan on a similar topic, how do you prepare candidates for the role they'll be taking on? Sherilyn said that probably if you asked everybody a year into their first term, if the job is what they expected, they'd almost universally say no, because it's more of everything. But how do you, mm -hmm. how do you prepare candidates, Nathan? Well, I've been involved with uh, other municipalities, and we haven't done this here, but there's candidate information sessions so you can actually have an opportunity before they even sign up and say, hey, I want to be in this show. Uh, they can ask questions about what is the actual role. Usually in those situations, you bring a counselor that's not running again to talk about how their experience was with counsel, what the workload is to have that real firsthand experience from a counselor to talk about. Those are very valuable tools. Uh, I often say, and, and I've always, originally I was very hesitant of being anywhere <laughs> after an election just because they don't bring out the best in people generally <laughs> and uh, but what I have said and what I have changed my point of view is that if a, if a candidate has questions about the municipality you know you should be there to answer them as best you can if they have legitimate uh, interest in learning uh, be there answer their questions and make sure that opportunity is available to everybody and fair and in good faith and I think that can help you uh, provide that information to counselors before, sorry, to candidates before they can become counselors. My my good friend Ian had an analogy about school unions, and I'm going to say I don't have it, but I'm going to sort of use an analogy from my favorite BBC television show, Yes Minister, when it comes to uh, potential council mayor walkabouts within the administration. Now, everyone on this call and everyone in this, in this uh, round table understands that Council has one staff member, and that is you, the city manager. 
I'm assuming there are people who first get elected say, I want to go talk to the greater operator. I want to go talk to the communications person. I want to go talk about X, Y, and Z with planning development. But technically, they only have one administration, and that is you, the city manager. How do you protect staff from those incoming uh, council members, because until that orientation orientation is done, people assume once I get elected, I can go tell that greater operator to go drive down Fifth or uh, Saskatchewan Avenue and clear the snow right to the pavement. Hopefully, by the time this airs, you guys will be back working on Saskatchewan Avenue and will be up and running here very shortly. So when I come back through in later this year, I can see a beautiful done Main Street. But how do you stop administration? Not administration. Account Council from directing administration in those early days of a new council? I assume that question's to me. <laughs> Either one, because technically, Sherilyn, you were a councillor prior to being uh, elected mayor. And I can assume that when you got elected, you may not have known that you weren't able to. Or if you did, you probably have met people who said, I'm going to get elected and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to tell every single water operator where they should be putting everything that needs to be done. How do you stop your council from going for to do a walkabout within administration and directing administration? And how does the city manager stop that from happening as well? Because you want to protect your administration at all costs as well. So whoever wants to take that first. I, I think we lay, I think for us, we kind of set that out on day two or day three, <laughs> like, really really quickly because you don't it's not I don't think it's something that you want to have to to dial back from because for those um they pe people hold on to things like that for a long time right in in their mind and so you just you want to stop it before it happens Nathan what about yourself yeah it's a question I think every CAO or city manager struggles with is how can you uh, how permissive do you want to be with that interaction between administration and council beyond this, not through the CAO or how restrictive do you want to be? And I know some CAOs are saying every single thing goes through me and thou shall not cross this line where some ha have a little bit more of a permissive attitude. For me, I think that uh, counselors need to understand the power dynamic. So, and I explained this during the orientation and I've talked to every counselor I've ever worked with with this guy. There's a difference between questions and direction <laughs> and there are ways to ask questions that seem like direction <laughs> and they need to understand the power dynamic of their role even if it's a question but like, don't you think this would be a good idea uh i say my general rule uh rule <clears throat> with the organization is if you have a question for administration and it's very similar to a question that anybody in the public may ask you know when it, when is the garbage route or is this changing or why do we do this uh Feel free to ask administration through email, CC me so I'm aware of the question, and then I can follow the chain. If there's something that administration needs to follow up on, then I'm aware of it. Uh, that's the best way, and then making sure that council understands what's a question, what's direction, and what's a question that implies direction. And I can monitor that. I'm, I'm more than happy to allow uh, members of the council ask, especially my senior administration, because they have a relationship with them around the council table because they're at our council meetings. But as long as it's a, it is a legitimate question, and it's through myself and I'm CC, then I can keep track of it. Honestly, it helps information get back to council quicker so they can answer maybe questions that they're getting from their the citizens at large. So I don't mind having that little bit of exchange as long as I'm in kept in the loop and then I can monitor if it potentially crosses the line. Haven't had uh, too many times where I've had to make those corrections. Uh, I've had very respectful councils, but so far that's worked for me. On that note, because you you deal with uh, Mayor Knox on a regular basis, probably compared to the other members of your council that are around that table, how important is it to keep them in the loop of what discussions you two have between each other so that way they're not left out in the lurch? Because at the end of the day, Mayor Knox, you're only one vote and you only have one vote on that council and each and every single one of the other council members who are there have the right to know what you are asking and what potentially what responses are you're getting so for you uh, mayor Knox, how important is it to keep your entire council abreast of what 
conversations you're having with the city manager. And from Nathan's perspective, how important is it when you hear a question from one council to respond to all councillors and not just keep everyone in the dark except that one councillor? So Mayor Knox, for yourself, how important is it to ensure that all council members are aware of what you're talking with the city manager about? Yeah, very important. And I think we do allow ourselves time to be able to communicate those. Um, and I think um, for, I think that I would say that Nathan and I have been pretty good at keeping each other in check for that of like, oh, we should tell the rest of council or vice versa, right? Because sometimes you do, you get wrapped up in conversations and and uh, making sure that we we are communicating that. And then really good of like we use a lot of email chains so if a counselor emails Nathan about something and we know that it could be more questions asked or information then we just reply all reply all is a great tool that we need to be using more often to communicate just the simple things Ian, I'm uh, sorry, and Nathan, what about yourself from uh, from a city manager's perspective? How important is it for you to keep those fellow councillors abreast of all the questions that you get from council members, not just the mayor? Yeah, it, tremendously important. And, and I think it's something that you've mentioned, you know, that I am the face administration, the mayor is the face of council. And sometimes if you keep those conversation loops very tight between those two uh, authority figures in the organization, it's not long till a counselor can justifiably feel like they're left out. Like, why am I at this table even if I'm not part of the decision-making process? So something I, uh, I've i implemented and it's been very well supported with council is that every six months I'm doing one-on-one -on -one meetings. We uh, go out of city hall, we have a lunch, we have a breakfast, and I have a standard agenda that I just kind of work through and just ask them questions about their portfolio, questions about how they feel about the relationship between administration and council. And then I get right down to the what I call the crack in the sidewalk uh, questions, you know, those little things they feel like, ah, I don't want to bother Nathan about, but this thing's been kind of bugging me. And I take those all down, I deal with them as quickly as I can. But it's a way to make sure that they have that personal relationship and that access with me that I work and mend and maintain those relationships individually with each counselor. Otherwise, you know, there could be a reason why one might felt uh, one of the counselors might feel left out or not part of the team, or maybe not uh, have as much access to administration in terms of moving forward their concerns and agenda. Before before I throw it over to Ian, I do have a follow up question that Mayor Knox, do you care if one of your fellow council members approaches Nathan with an issue? Not not at all. Not at all. And I think, I mean, if I was going to put a tip for other administration and in a book or something, I would say to do these check-ins because I, I do think it gives um, a council the opportunity to have access and to, you know, to, like Nathan says, some of those things that maybe are are sitting there. And, it, and it's also... Because then, Nathan, if there's things that come up where me as the mayor should know about that maybe I could change or do a little differently, then he can communicate those with me so that we can make sure that we're a cohesive group working together. I, I think it's great. And then on the flip side of that, Nathan, do you care? You kind of openly said it already, but you're okay with uh, council approaching and asking questions of senior staff, those directors and managers, but I'm assuming you have check weekly check-ins with them to make sure that what council's asking them is relayed back to you. So you have an idea of what council's appetite is or what council's needs are being asked of. Yeah. Like I said, that, that CC in an email, I don't usually, I, I do ask that it is email because you then you, you can you know track and follow the conversation. Uh, but in terms of senior, I, I think that's important that Chris that you mentioned senior administration because my, my senior administration is around the council table at meetings. Council should feel comfortable asking them questions about what's going on in their respective department. But I use the word senior administration because it is a very different power dynamic if you have councillors asking frontline staff questions. And I, I I've never really had an issue with that. Uh, but that's something that I would ask to be corrected. No, you go through the top manager, not the person at the front desk, because that power dynamic, the void is just too large to have a reasonable conversation. It's fine until it isn't. Yeah. Uh, I switched that we've talked a lot about the kind of internal dynamics of the relationships and the trust and role of clarity and all that stuff. But 
Every community has its negative influencers who say either that you're not doing what you're supposed to do or didn't campaign on. You've all, everywhere has got that coffee shop Senate, those guys who meet it Tuesday morning in the A&W who say you're not doing common sense. How do you manage that sort of information that's either coming into the, the city or is being talked about the city? So Cheryl, I'm to you with that. Um, I think, I think it's always a challenge. Um, one thing that I really, well, I really think about, and I know that our council really thinks about is how we're communicating on a regular basis. Um, because I often, I, I believe the more you tell people, the less they can make up. And so I want to make sure that that Senate has at least some credible information when they're having their coffee, that maybe they can start sharing it. There's always going to be naysayers. I mean, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here if there wasn't there wasn't that. Um, I I take it as sometimes I take it as a motivator, you know, where where if you know I'm hearing negative about a decision we've made or that a misinformation that's out there, then that means we have to do a better job of of getting information out there. Um, and then you also just have to shake your head sometimes and and take it. I I think, well, Nathan said to me one day where I was, I don't know, dealing with something, it said, would you take, what was it, take criticism from somebody you wouldn't ask for advice from? And so I always <laughs> have that in the back of my head. That That's his role as an administrator too, is to sometimes talk me off the, you know, he's he, 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 Is he your sober with, second thought? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's been in this game for longer than, right? Like that's what I think sometimes councillors and elected officials forget is that your administrators and they've they've been in this game for longer than you, so they understand this world way better than you and you need to respect that for sure. So if you are as a as elected officials transient, you've elect you if you've accepted the position from somebody else, you add as much value as you can, and then you pass it on to somebody else. How, Mayor, do you engage in things like training or professional development to keep your skills top-notch and to learn new things? Is that something that your council consciously does? Um, I think I think everybody has different levels of, of that, right? Um, you know, from our council, just I can think in my head of the ones that I know that are diving in deep into information that's coming out there, others that are more on sort of the community level. Um, I think we have to provide as much information as we can. We love to be involved in things like our Association of Manitoba Municipalities and FCM we take part in, all of those learning opportunities. I think networking with colleagues around the province and the country is also great to grow in your role. And I think making sure we have those opportunities. Sure. Nathan, you spoke a little while ago. You used the term portfolio. Do members of council have portfolios in Portage? Yeah, and the structure for this council is that each councillor will have a portfolio of responsibility. And so, for example, we'll have our protective services, transportation, community services. Each councillor has a set portfolio. Now, those are mainly for in terms of reporting at council. So reports that are provided and done by administration would go, for example, to protective services, which is our fire police, emergency planning, et cetera, bylaw. And let's say we were talking uh, about the purchase of body cameras. I'm just picking up a random random item. Uh, so administration will prepare the report. That counselor will read the report. They'll put forward the administrative recommendation, and then the council has a discussion on it. But it's important when you talked about keeping all of council informed about what's going on. You know, you could have a lot of emails, but if there's something happening in the protective services envelope, uh, that is that I'll let the mayor know, and I'll let that counselor know first. If there's something happening in the utility, it's the exact same practice. So the real day-to-day, -day, a little bit more, you know, where it starts to become, this may become a council issue. I keep those councillors informed first, and then when it becomes a bigger issue, I keep everybody informed. And I think uh, councillors take a lot of responsibility and uh, interest in their portfolio. And it, it's an interesting format. I, I previously worked for the city of Brandon. They didn't have that format. It took a little getting used to, but I think it works well. 
I can I just say something before you jump in there, Ian? Um, what, when you were mentioning those portfolios, I was like, I know these people. I know the, the chair of the planning and development. I know the chair of the protective services because I just spoke about body cams to Councillor Doyle just recently on this show. So I apologize. Go ahead, Ian. All right, I'll get back into this. Do you ever find that the manager of utilities doesn't know who the boss is? Like, is the boss the council member? Is the boss the CAO, city manager? Yeah, I sometimes run into that in portfolios. Yeah, no, that's a it's a fair comment. I, I have not come across that yet. And, I, and to be fair, we actually had a counselor that was in charge of the utility portfolio that worked in the utility before they retired. So you would expect that would probably be the most challenging circumstance. Uh, that counselor, I think, definitely had a respect for what administration's roles were and what they weren't. Didn't mean they didn't have very good questions because they knew, they, they frankly, they knew a portfolio better than I did. Uh, so it was always interesting having those discussions. They were well informed, but they respected that line. I think that uh, your question, going back to the original question, does that person know who the boss is? I feel that hasn't been an issue, but I can definitely see if you don't manage that communication effectively. Uh, it can be. Now, when I, sometimes when there's a major line break that affects, we have a lot of really important industry in our community and a line break can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour. Sometimes I get the email from that supervisor and they CC that counselor. I'm okay with that because I want that counselor to know because we're in a small enough community that the manager of that industry might call that counselor and I sure want them informed as well. So it's, it's very, uh, to its core, it's a, very, a lot of transparency, but that has worked for us so far. Um, so, I'm, cautious of, I'm cautious of time here. And I want to talk about uh, the unicorn in the room because this dynamic seems very personable. It seems very uh, well-oiled and it seems like something that a lot of municipalities would want to emulate. Now, I'm assuming this is not just something that has happened overnight and has taken some time to get to where we are. But for you, Marilyn Knox, I've got to start and ask, what advice would you give your fellow mayors, not only in Manitoba, because we do have listeners across Canada, about working with a potential CAO, city manager, CEO, CAO, whatever they're called in their jurisdiction, to ensure that they have a partnership, a relationship as equal or and I don't want to say better because it seems like you guys have the best relationship ever to quote Donald Trump, that you guys have got it great. You're amazing. You're doing great things. How do you ensure, or what advice would you give to your fellow mayors to get the relationship that you two have in their own community? Um, I would say for mayors to take the responsibility to learn what your role is in governance Um understand that your CAOs or, or, or city managers are experts in their field. Um, and I think the advice would be to, to start with building trust in those relationships. Um, I think it 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 honestly it it worries it does worry me and i feel for municipalities because when we got elected in october 26 2022 i believe in manitoba there's 22 open vacancies for this position and that that frightens me because that just shows me that maybe the the lines of governance and administration are crossed all over the place and and i don't find it fair to to people working in these in these roles so it mayors are elected to to lead and to lead council and to lead your city and so they need to to take that responsibility themselves to to really understand the role and also be able to communicate to what they're looking, who that employee, what the expectations are of them. But if, but if they can't lead the governance side of things, then they're gonna have a hard time helping the rest of council understand that. But it has to start with them. 
Nathan, you you lucked out when it comes to a great relationship working with a mayor. And I'm not trying to blow smoke at all. It truly seems like you have a great working relationship. What advice would you give that first time CAO, city manager, or someone who's been in the job for 10 years and going, I wish I had what Portage the Prairie had and sort of emulate what their relationship is like with their mayor or Reeve or council? Because like I said, it seems like you have a unicorn in Portage the Prairie of a relationship where everything seems sunshine and roses. <laughs> That, that's a, a nice way of putting it. You know, I just came back from uh, professional development with the Canadian Association of Manitoba, sorry, Municipal Administrators. And uh, a lot of the CEOs of the room talked about the challenges they had managing the council CEO dynamic. And the one thing uh, I will say is that, yes, I, I feel like I was very fortunate to have the positive relationship I have with this council. And frankly, I had with the previous council. And I think... There's just one thing that uh, if I was to talk to a CEO that's starting or maybe even beginning is just having those frank conversations because, you know, hey, I, we sit around a management table and we talk about putting forward reports to council and keeping council informed. And you know what? Sometimes it's easy to, to say, hey, you know, you can kind of fudge your mistakes a bit, not say that you screwed up as big as, but this organization is run by humans and we make mistakes all the time. We screw up all the time. We do. And I'd rather be frank with council and have them hear that from us. And when they hear you owning up to your mistakes, telling them what you learned, they, that develops that position of trust that you have with council. So they know that you're going to be frank with them. They know they're not going to have any surprises, like going back to that argument or that statement, no surprises. And to have that foundation of trust to know when, hey, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to tell you about it so you don't get surprised by them. They'll give you that uh, ability to make those mistakes because a lot of the time when you try and reach out to make mistakes, you're going to take on new things and be innovative. Those are going to happen, but you're also going to accomplish great things. So just being that really, really key is having that transparency about trust and about being honest about how the organization is running. So they have a good feeling of the pulse of the organization as a whole. So to follow up my last question for you, Mayor Knox, do you feel like you have a pulse on what administration is doing? Yes, uh, absolutely. I feel I feel well informed all the time. Um, I feel the one thing that I wanted to add though, when we were talking about um, just that with managers and the rest of staff is I think there's a miss there's a piece there too is that you don't want to be directing any staff, but you want to have rapport with the rest of the city staff if you can, right? Because they need to be, they need to know that you're connect, you're not just this group of people in a room making decisions on their half, but behalf. But yeah, I think I think we do I I do. I think we know what's going on because we communicate well and we we're constantly changing how we do that or being cognizant of it anyway. And the last question to you, Nathan, is do you feel like you have a pulse on what council wants from administration and your relationship? I do. I do, Chris, because, you know, honestly, I just did that check in with all the members of council. And honestly, the question for, is, Frank, is how do you feel councils? How's, how's council doing as a whole, as a team? And when they say, I feel really positive about the direction council is going, I feel really positive about the strategic directives that we've taken and given to administration. And I feel positive about how administration is implementing those strategic directives. When you can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation without everybody in the room, because let's be honest, when everyone's in the room, there's a little bit more likely that people aren't going to give you their exact thoughts they're thinking, especially if they may be skewed to the negative. So uh, I feel like I have a reasonably good pulse. Politicians have the knack of surprising you and uh, you do your best and predict as best as you can, but I do. And I will just add, uh, because you referenced the mayor and having a, uh, having communicating to the rest of the members, uh, sorry, communicating to the whole organization, all the staff about what they're trying to accomplish. You know, I just finished taking the strategic directive and meeting with each single work group through this entire organization and explaining where council wants to go from a governance point of view. So administration knows when they're asked to do this particular thing and they can connect it back to that strategic priority list they have that connection with council and understand where it's coming from. So that communication, I think, is really important. Nathan, 
Mayor Knox, I want to thank you both for sitting down with Ian and myself today talking about the role of city manager and the relationship that a goes into building a great community like Portage La Prairie. It seems like I've been spending a lot of time in Portage La Prairie on all of my shows, and I appreciate all of the wonderful work that you guys do, and I can't wait to meet you guys in person again in at AMM uh, later on this year and probably at FCM because it sounds like you're a part of that as well. So thank you so much for my heart about my heart for taking time out of your busy schedules to sit down with Ian and myself to talk about what goes into building a great relationship between council and the CAO. Thank you. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Take care. Ian, I want to thank you so much for joining me today on uh, Municipal Affairs. It's always good to do a sort of cross-promotion of our other show, The Political Dredges, Local Government at Work. Um, fantastic group of people in Portage La Prairie, eh? They've got something to be envious about. Uh, sorry, they've got something that others can be envious about, about that relationship. I mean, a lot of it is cultural. A lot of it is also based on the, the human beings who happen to be occupying those two seats. So good for them for building that, and hopefully it continues. Now, the role of the CEO has changed dramatically over the last few years, in my personal opinion, and the conversations I've been having with CEOs and elected officials over the last few months. In your time, have you seen the role change dramatically as well, or is it something that is just sort of happening in the last two, three years? I don't know that the role itself has changed. I think somehow how it's executed and how it's understood sometimes change, particularly around when we started the whole conversation talking about trust. And to me, that's a huge one. Without trust, there, there is no real relationship. Um, the mayor was making reference to vacancies after the election. We see that across the country. And that, to me, is a sad state of affairs. Most of the time, it's it's either multiple members of council who aren't doing, aren't working well together, or it's the CAO who's not. And chances are, a lot of times, I think it's the council rather than the CAO. And even in then, it's fit rather than expertise. So this will be our second installment of our uh, complete dive into the role of the CAO. Our next episode around the CAO, we'll be talking with a panelist from those who have gone from the council table to the CAO chair. So those who have turned from a council member to a CAO, that will be coming up in the next few weeks. And then we will have our conclusion uh, for a live episode of the Municipal Affairs from Brandon, Manitoba later on this spring. Uh, Ian, it's always a pleasure. And until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.